it's a huge honor to be here, um, uh, kicking off this lecture series and, um, and, and celebrating Frank as well in the process. Um, I, um, Frank was a huge inspiration to me, like he was to many of you. Um, and it wasn't just the marvelous buildings that you saw he did, but as we all know, it, that amazing, engaging person. Uh, and, uh, you know, just so thoughtful and patient. Oh, but I do always love, uh, we were lucky enough to have someone from Frank's office work in our office for many years. And the one story that he told me about Frank that I just adored knowing, which was that Frank, that, that no meeting was allowed to last longer than an hour or 45 minutes or something. After that, Frank walked out. Anyway, and I, I've yet to... <laughs> I've yet to acquire quite that. I think you have to, I don't know, but I think he did it even before he was as old as we saw in some of these older photographs. But, um, but anyway, to Frank and to his amazing legacy. Um, I, um, like Frank, uh, David and I and a number of the architects in the office started uh, with O'Neill as well in that uh, graduate program. And, um, and when we were uh, you know, fresh out of school and at, at O'Neill's office. We were mainly working with O'Neill on houses. So we were started just like Frank as house architects. And, you know, these amazing projects, 1964, this birthday house, uh, still so inspiring, so remarkable, such a great client um, and such an inspiring architect to create such a beautiful building. And then about the time that we started our office, I think the Cliff Morton house, this is a terrible photograph, so apologies to Frank, um, a gorgeous house in San Antonio on the edge of San Antonio. It was a series of three gables, and, uh, and it uh, was quintessential, um, it, both modern house, but also a, a connection to, um, to the beautiful, simple um, uh, farm buildings uh, that that you find in the hill country, uh, and then the and then the landscape was sliding in and out of this building. It was uh, a great inspiration, and I I used it as a foil when I had tough clients. I would a few times I took them by Frank's house and said, "See, even you know we could do something, you know, that's traditional but 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 classically modern." So. Anyway, a huge debt we all owe to Frank and, uh, and a great inspiration. So uh, I know that a lot of you know our work, but I'll give you a little background because as, as with Frank, growing up in Texas was a hugely important uh, uh, part of what, what, what makes our architecture. And, and for me, uh, David grew up in Austin, but for me it was growing up on the coast, sailing, and then also spending... Uh, weekends and long vacations at my family's place out on the headwaters of the, of the West and Oasis. And so it's the combination of, of uh, it was this place that we had out there on the West and Oasis was um, a little off the grid uh, cabin. So it was basically camping, but it gave me both the sailing and that camping gave me huge appreciation for the weather, for, the, for a cool breeze, for the importance of shade, and for the for the need of a a big wall to block a, a you know a cold norther that that would show up at some point, and then the landscape of Texas hugely inspiring because of the diversity, uh, the diversity of rainfall, the diversity of topography, and then uh, many of the vernacular buildings hugely inspirational uh, that are that are scattered around the state, uh, built not by architects but by those who as I would say, couldn't afford to get it wrong. And they were buildings that had breezeways and porches and, and they knew how to work with the weather. Uh, and then uh, O'Neill certainly taught us the, the, the value of materials and, and the, the opportunities that as you work in different places to leverage the craft that you find in different areas. And, and then for us at Lake Plato, we always uh, were also inspired by the by the simple industrial and agricultural buildings, and and not in a sentimental way, but but because of their uh, straightforward solutions to uh, to problems and the and the use and the efficiency of of materials. The slide on the upper left hand upper right hand corner is a 
is a simple shade structure that, that um, David and I always get a great deal of inspiration. And it was just put up in a cattle pen uh, to create uh, shade, but done with you know, just cables and steel uh, and, and corrugated metal. And then for us also, the artists that ha have worked in the West that, that, that got the landscape, like James Terrell and, and, and Donald Judd, who appreciated the, these big wide open spaces. And, Chris, uh, and Christo, he uh, did this running fence when I was at Stanford and had you know, the idea of creating this beautiful curtain that, uh, that, that enhanced and, 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 and showcased these gorgeous simple hills uh, is still an image that uh, I can't pry loose in my head. So when we... Um, uh, when David and I left O'Neill Ford's office in 1984, um, we um, started with projects like this. That, uh, this is the Lassiter's Ranch House, uh, and they might be here tonight. They continue to be huge patrons of ours over the many, many years. Um, and this house is down in South Texas. And, and, and we were lucky enough to begin our office with projects like this, and we did others. And the reason we were so lucky to be working uh, on houses like this is that because they're out, out in the landscape, the goals that our clients had for these projects were to connect to the environment. They didn't really, and certainly Garland and Molly didn't, weren't talking about style. They wanted to talk about how a building could uh, connect to the weather and how you could be as part of the outdoors but still cool or part of the outdoors and still be warm. And so in this case, it was a, all passive, a great deal of passive cooling. And he, I mean, we did have an air conditioning system for, for those you know, kind of hot, tough times to take a nap, but, but, it was, but it was still thought through with big porches, rolling walls, uh, cupolas for passive cooling. And then, uh, and then in each one of these, uh, opportunities uh, was building our portfolio and our experience of working with the weather. And this was a great example of a client that had a limited budget and, and it's more porch than house, as we like to still say. Um, it, that's an all screened room that's, that's on the image on the right, uh, the Carraro house. And then a lot of times on these early projects, we were thinking uh, not just about the climate and the weather, but what would the materials we'd use and what, what opportunities a particular project would give us to use a different material. So in this case, the air barns that we did uh, for Tommy Lee Jones, that um, for uh, polo horses, it was, uh, we were thinking, how could we make a, a quote, lighter than air barn? And we used, and we wanted to use the two and three eighths recycled oil field pipe, which was cheap at that time. Uh, but still wouldn't span long distances. And this is before, I think we were, uh, you'll see another really great example of this of when we're working with Tom Taylor on, on things. But, but in this case, doing really simple trusses and pushing the steel. But, but the, the reason I share these is just that these early projects were opportunities to start to uh, uh, kind of hone our philosophy when we were a small office and not doing a whole lot of projects. And then these, you're going to see a series of these iPad drawings. This is now how I and sketch and communicate with the rest of the office. But these are some early, uh, early iterations of Ted's iPad sketches. But the, the reason I'm sharing you with these is just that uh, when, and we didn't, I didn't do this sketch. This is now a retro sketch. This is looking back on a project and now sketching on it. But what we would, how we, but this is very indicative of how we thought when we were working on these projects is that we would think more about or as much about the outdoor space and the, and the potential of outdoor rooms as the indoor rooms. And so we'd use the buildings as building blocks and we'd think about a wall. We'd think about the trees as a place to park, uh, not just uh, you know, something to stare at. So you created shade, you parked under the trees, and then you went into an oasis that was created by these building blocks. Uh, so the landscaping. And the landscape was a hugely important component of our work. And then one of my favorite projects, which, is, which is, uh, was a, an off-the-grid house outside of San Antonio where we just built basically a wall that blocked the north winds and it opened up to the southeast breeze and it was just a, a, a big screened room uh, that you would move a bed on wheels and store the kids in the walls. And anyway, it was one of the... Um, <laughs> And, and <laughs> anyway, 
But, but from those projects, we um, developed a pretty uh, strong philosophy. Of, and, and we started, David and I started as a partnership, and then we, and then we added uh, marvelous people. And you can see now, this is the, the black and whites or the kind of early part of the office, and then this lower um, uh, photograph is um, at... These are all at the retreat out at that West Texas place that we have. We continue to share that with the whole office for a long weekend retreat. Um, but I, uh, and now we're almost 100 uh, or, or so architects. But um, with the way we are able to, I think, continue to do um, work that's consistent and, and, uh, and is that we began with a very with a philosophy that wasn't a personal one, a, pers a personal design approach. It was one that uh, both clients and architects could embrace. And so as we grew the office and we were lucky enough to get some really great talent, um, they were coming because of that this was a direction that they could understand and embrace. And there was plenty of room both for client and for for, for younger architects uh, to continue to uh, evolve the design. So I like to think that it's, um, you know, that, 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 you know, that it, I mean, anyway, it, do, it does truly continue to get interesting and, and, and it and it's continues to be fun, uh, even if we are that many people. Um, so I've organized this talk a little bit like uh, most of the, some of the books that, that we've done uh, that have been on our work, uh, which is by landscape, because that's kind of how I think of them. And one of my favorite landscapes is the what I'm calling ranch land, which is the big swath of open landscape outside the cities that runs from South Texas all the way up uh, to Montana, you could say. And um, and it's the, the work that's in that landscape beyond the cities uh, that I find continue to find a great deal of inspiration and joy in doing. <laughs> And part of it is because there, is, um, there aren't the constraints of the neighbors of what the building next door looks like. You're, you're really responding to the landscape and you're working with usually clients who are interested in connecting to the outdoors. And so this first one is just uh, west, uh, just west of Dallas uh, for the Dixon Water Foundation, uh, the Josie Pavilion. And it's just a series of very simple gables. Uh, it's a visitor center on a, a, a one of their uh, properties that is a it's a big prairie restoration. And uh, this project um, we did uh, as a living building challenge, which was uh, uh, when well, many of you because you're architects, so you, you know that it's anyway. It's the it's kind of a high level of of um, grading sustainability, but it's completely off the grid and it doesn't consume any energy. And, and then the waste that it creates, you've, you've uh, flushed it through a gray water treatment, uh, little wetlands system. And, and the material is, you know, is from nearby. But the, the program lent itself to this. I mean, this would not be a place you'd want to go and have a, a retreat in the, in the off times in a really hot summer or, or a cold winter. But, but it's still in those swing moments, these, these rolling uh, slat walls or rolling and, or pivoting glass doors uh, would mitigate and, and control, you know, and, and create and, and with abundant shade. And then the whole way the building works where it takes all the water off the roofs and and funnels it into uh, cisterns that's been used for the bathrooms and, and, and drinking water and such. Um, so uh, another project that is now just north of, of Fort Worth and Weather uh, Weatherford um, is, uh, is one that's for horses, cutting horses. So they they're obviously can make for great clients because there, no, there was no discussion about what style or what modernism was about. It's just they were strictly interested in, in having a cool place to uh, turn into uh, become a cutting horse. Um, and this was a great collaboration with uh, Thomas Taylor's firm um, and, a, and a, just a, a, a tour de force of using uh, pipe, <laughs> rusted pipe. Uh, but again, the, the sketches, uh, thinking of, of even for the horses, what the outdoor spaces and the indoor spaces. This was a, also a collaboration with Terry Arterburn's uh, firm. 
as well and thinking about where the buildings would go and what the spaces between the buildings would be like. Um, and, and, it's, um, and thinking from the very beginning of what we were going to make it with, how the maintenance would work, how you could uh, mitigate a breeze with perforated, uh, corrugated metal, which we've done a lot of. And, and again, the, ha the horses seemed quite happy. And this is a good shot of how complicated some of Thomas's work can get. But, uh, but we had held some amazing welders uh, and a great contractor. It's also from, here from Dallas. Um, and this is the arena that's all perforated, uh, corrugated metal um, and, and had a great sense of... Um, but, but not all of our clients that we're working with out in the wide open plains of what I'm calling ranch land are necessarily going to or have embraced this same kind of raw aesthetic. And so this is an example that I want to share with you, which was for, in this case, an interior designer, very, very thoughtful uh, interior designer from, from New York, who we had done a project for her her parents, and, uh, and she said, you know, what I don't want is what you gave my parents. <laughs> anyway, so this is, um, so th this, in this case, we had, uh, and this is how we think, this is kind of classic uh, sketches that we'll do, even when we're working with the talented Terry Arterburn and, and a studio outside, but we're also thinking, uh, and they're nice enough to let us, allow us to think about the landscape as well. Um, but we're thinking about, in this case, it was the top of a hill, a mesa, and thinking of the different program elements to make a space on top of that mesa. And so it's a series of tennis court and swimming pool building and guest and, and main house. But just thinking of all of those, how they would relate, how they would be a little bit different, and how they'd make a sense of place on this hill uh, for someone who is looking for more design, and every once in a while we'd sneak in some breezeways and porches uh, so that she, they would still be connected to the outdoors. Um, but using water, using the stone from you know the hill country uh, to create these series of spaces, big spaces, so uh, kind of letting parts of the walls that wanted to be solid, uh, and then and then the um, you know the living spaces that are then intimately connected to the outdoors. Um, and this is a series of open porches, which um, the, where you go from uh, uh, bedrooms, and but yet, yet still using the shade device to both, you know, slow down a, a breeze and and uh, and then the guest house. So so that was the main house, and the guest house was just a, just a set kind of simple stone walls that you uh, that make space that you walk by, but if you walk into them. You you were uh, you have a big open porch that has these louvers because it's facing west to make it comfortable uh, even when the low angle sun and then the pool building and, it, and it's just so these series of pavilions along the edge of this mesa. Um, so not a ranch house, but worked like a ranch house. So and 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 in and in, and, and in the a very similar area. So this was that's in the hill country on the Guadalupe Valley. Uh, and nearby on another creek, um, similar kind of large acreage, so a lot of places to choose from where we were building. But in this case, rather than go to the top of the hill, you know, we suggested um, we were meeting in this little funny house uh, right on this dam that you see here. So there's a little spring creek that started right there, not a big uh, drainage area, and just this cool little body of water with this really, really crude concrete um, dam. And so we're sitting there in this house and talking about going onto the hot hills to look for a, a site. And we said, you know, why don't we just stay hunkered down in this cool spot? And that's where we ultimately built the house. We changed the, the landscape or we took roads away that, that were keeping you from understanding how beautiful the place was and then put the house right where the old... Uh, house was and right on top of the dam and let the dam became uh, the inspiration really for that house so you know a sketch again talking about the solid the black sections are what I'm what I would call the private part of the house the bathrooms the closets things like that uh, and then the open spaces are the more public rooms and so using the private part of the house to to uh, shelter, but and then to open the public parts to the, 
and we were at this kind of interesting intersection of two water bodies, and the dam was designed to move the water from the main from the main branch of the creek over to uh, kind of a, just a draw that didn't have water, and so the, it was an artificial part of the of the of these two branches coming together. But 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 anyway, the dam uh, forced uh, with a pipe forced the water over to the, to the right side of, on that image, and so in the redesign of the house, we created what felt like a house built on a dam, so a big concrete base that, that it sat on. You could dive right into the water from the porches, um, and then using um, this dam system to, we were working with a, a landscape architect, Christy Tenike from Austin, and using the, a lot of the ideas of movement of water as the ornament on the, in the landscaping, so using these troughs that took water from one side of the stream to the other side and then the house just you know perched right on the on the water built of stone and steel and 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 windows that uh, could completely open and then uh, using utilitarian things like the garage and stuff to make space with uh, walls courtyards so that they contrasted with that with the uh, with the big with the with the river on the other side and screen spaces. Um, and then the, 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 the final one of these ranch houses that I'm sharing with you um, are, is the house that we did out in, um, in Montana outside, right near Bozeman. And there, uh, again, similar conditions in the sense of the landscape, a big, broad, soft landscape but a far more severe weather pattern being in Montana. And so thinking of how a house can be more all weather, still embrace and connect to the outdoors in the summer and the spring, uh, but also work in the winter. So the house in this case, we um, bermed in. So this image shows you that uh, the upper part of the house, uh, a lot of the more private part of the house, we're, we're benching in to a, a low hill, and then we did sod roofs on, on those elements, so they basically kind of disappear in the landscape, and then just a pavilion for the main living space, and building it as well out of steel and wood, and, um, and, and using structure, as is often the case, as our main uh, source of ornament for the house, and thinking of what the... Um, and, and thinking even when we're in, you know, pushing into the earth uh, and needing to use concrete, using that as also as the ornament. So letting the building process inform our architecture is a big part of how we think. Um, and, the, and the wonderful thing uh, these days in our office is that we're getting to work in a lot of different landscapes. And so in the desert, in this case, this is um, in Phoenix, um, we, uh, we, we now do a lot of university work. This is a fairly early university project, but it really is still one of my favorites. And it was, we had enough building program that we could begin to transform this, this fledgling campus. This is the Arizona State University's Polytechnic Campus. And they, um, the assignment was, looked grim in the beginning, which was, it was an old army base, uh, and it was all asphalt and really bad buildings and, and completely so the image up on the upper one is our site and the image on the lower left hand corner is what it looked like when we began and then the image on the right is what was just beyond uh, the edges of that asphalt was this amazing Sonora desert, Sonoran desert and so the idea was to uh, use the buildings and the new landscaping to bring back this magical place. And so all the buildings on this, on, the, on this drawing, on the lower part of the drawing, are all the new buildings that we were doing. So we had enough program that we could build, uh, and we were building on the, and we did that mall, and all those squiggly lines imply a, a beautiful desert mall. <laughs> um, anyway, and so the, and the greener pieces were these oasis courtyards. So we were thinking of, uh, from the beginning of what these different departments, how they would create a different condition from the desert mall, and then you would walk along 
the, uh, the northern side of these buildings, these new buildings in the shade uh, from the building. So, um, and this is, uh, so this is the Transport Mall. So the, originally this was, um, was all uh, asphalt and all the plumbing uh, and all the, you know, all the site drainage and, and sewer systems uh, on, the, on the base were naturally underground, but they were undersized. And so we took that, took that as an opportunity to make a desert swale that slows the water down. Uh, and we, again, worked with uh, Christy Tenike uh, in Austin on this project, but, uh, but took, brought back the desert, turned uh, this mall into a desert mall, and then the water ends up in a green space, in a, in a gathering space, uh, as a, in, a, in a kind of a holding tank at times. Uh, and the buildings were made of rusted steel that made sense for the desert, so thinking about what materials uh, make sense for that place. We had... Um, uh, uh, the idea of creating uh, what we called uh, student baskets, places for students to linger and to stay on campus that would elevate them and have views over, the, uh, over that desert mall. And then all the, we had a lot of circulation in this building, and so one of the uh, methods of saving some money but also making a more logical and, and thoughtful building was to put most of the circulation outdoors. So the so it circu you circulate through these uh, atriums that have perforated metal uh, way above the, the, the roof. Uh, and, and so thinking a lot about how to, um, you know, the, the marvelous thing about the desert versus working in Texas is that, one, it's uh, and in that Phoenix area, is that you don't have as cold winters. Uh, you do have a severe s heat and, and sun, uh, but if you can, but it's so dry and it cools off at night. So uh, you can really create some really, really marvelous spaces in a, in a passive uh, uh, manner. And so that was what we were doing in addition to uh, changing the campus, was changing the way built people interacted with the, with the climate uh, in, that, in that really beautiful place. And one of uh, the thing I really love in our office is we continue to do houses as we do university work or larger work, and jumping back and forth in scale uh, uh, continues to be inspiring. And and so while we were working on the ASU project, we were also doing a house for a, a couple here in Dallas, the Browns that uh, in Scottsdale, and uh, again in this case it was a house that was kind of right amongst some other houses, but adjacent to one of these desert golf courses. Uh, and so thinking about how the building could edit out the neighbors, uh, but yet create really wonderful outdoor spaces that you could enjoy. And so this house is basically like one big, enormous umbrella roof over a series of uh, solid uh, elements in the house. And then using walls that would bounce light into rooms uh, so that even though there's a neighbor on the other side of this wall, you had a sense of, of these small landscapes, these small desert landscapes, and contrasting with kind of the larger views that were going off in the other direction. So, um, so working at, at this kind of finer level of detail and scale at the same time of working with a larger scale like the Arizona State um, University Project. And so, from the desert to water, and for me, um, and having grown up in South Texas where um, you couldn't get away from a conversation about when the last time it rained, um, it is a huge inspiration to get to work on projects that, that deal with water. And um, one of my favorites still is the project that we did in East Texas, again with Terry Arterburn's firm, and it was the, um, right in the middle of the little town of Orange, uh, and it was a, a, an amazing story of, of a landscape that was really once celebrated, then abused, and then, and, then, and then a great school teacher came to us and said, you know, we could make a great place out of this. And so it's a 300 or so, 250 acres in the middle of the little town of Orange, uh, but the, the um, school teacher, science teacher, found he was doing classes in this uh, in this. Um, 
landscape and this wildscape that was in the middle of the town, what had happened was it was part of the Letcher Stark property, uh, who was the prominent barren citizen of, of Orange, and he had had a, um, he had had a, whoops, I'll go back. He had had a, a, an amazing garden at one time uh, with, that was uh, surrounded by lakes, man-made lakes that were cut out of the wetlands, that were surrounded by beautiful azaleas. And then uh, a freeze came and uh, broke his heart, never went back, and left it and to just uh, go, go feral, as we would say. And what happened was, the, so, the, so it became an amazing birding, bird sanctuary right in the middle of the heart of the little town. And, and uh, the science professor found that in, in a place like Orange, uh, nature was actually something fairly scary to a lot of the people in that community. And he found that uh, and had uh, great success uh, in taking kids who really didn't even engage or know or think about nature. Uh, he created a little outdoor classroom at this place and, and, really, and created some uh, really quite remarkable kids uh, in that high school program. And so when, when, it, when uh, it came about that the Stark Foundation had more money to spend, or suddenly they were free to, they'd been in lawsuits and all, all kinds of things uh, in their, at, at, at one moment in their foundation career. But anyway, now that money was free and it was time to make a, a place out of this. Um, and these sketches just are showing you kind of uh, thoughts on what to do with this body, and I won't go into these, but this is one of my little funny sketches that I don't know that Terry has seen, because this was also after, we didn't, I didn't actually do this sketch while we were working, but, but the idea here was to use the buildings, most of the buildings we thought it would, because this was a remarkable landscape, we didn't want to mess the landscape up, so we felt it was very important to put the building where buildings had already been, put them on the edge of the landscape, and do as little to the landscape other than uh, some levels of restoration as possible. And in fact, we were worried about how you would even go into this landscape because suddenly it could be, you know, overrun by people. And so we used the water system as the only method that people can go from one classroom to another. We have these outdoor classrooms. But the main infrastructure building, the building of where offices and bookstores and, you know, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, education center, uh, that was all what we called kind of a, it felt like a, a, a glorious back of house series of buildings that collected their water, that used the, and here we have such plentiful rainwater, um, it was about what you do with that water. And one of the, one of the big challenges on this property was the lakes that had been created by the Starks were highly polluted. They were oxygen starved, they had all kinds of green muck growing in them, and uh, and so we uh, so the idea was to let the visitor center become the uh, kidneys for the land, and so the water uh, circulates through a series uh, through these series of buildings. So the buildings are these, as I call them, kind of infrastructure buildings that celebrate water. Um, but some of my favorites was this whole series of of, of water cells that where we would run the water through them uh, and, and, then, and then as it went through the system, then ultimately it would return back to the lake in a, in a, in a, in a pure state. But you, it became part of the heart of this main courtyard and then these greenhouses uh, surround it. In reality, we had huge wetlands that we used because you couldn't do all this cleansing with just a small amount of wetlands. So we, we had a, a, you know, larger ones further apart. And then we built the education classrooms that we did build that were away from this main uh, education center. So these are just classroom buildings for the most part. We built those out of, out of um, recycled um, uh, and fell timber from the hurricanes. We'd, we were building, as we were building this project, we, one of the made big hurricanes hit and then, but we had also, Katrina had already been before that, so we were using a lot of recycled wood from those, from the hurricane prone areas. And then, and then when we did nestle up against some of the, the nature areas, thinking about how to do blinds. And then one of my favorites is that the transportation system was a series of just uh, uh, propane boats that made uh, very little noise and, uh, and, and, uh, 
and they would and and that was the method that you would then move uh, through the gardens. And then we did these little simple little um, these simple classroom buildings that were off the grid that were located in kind of critical habitat in different parts of the gardens. Um, and a, and, a, and a very recent uh, water project was one right on one of the lakes outside of San Antonio or outside of Austin. Uh, and this is, you know, we're lucky enough often to get to work with friends um, or clients becoming friends. But in this case, these were some old friends that I knew pretty well. And, uh, and in this case, um, you know, the great thing about, you know, the, the, the trick of residential architecture is getting to know your client really well and, uh, and, and, um, and, and getting a, an appreciation for what, uh, what is unique about them and what would make this place unique for them. And in this case, um, these clients, the, uh, my friend is the daughter of an architect like Frank, but not quite like Frank, in this case, a high-rise architect from Houston. And so um, I would always kind of imagine kind of uh, mining uh, Cy Morris's ideas on what he might do on this site for his daughter. So anyway, we built a little bitty high rise, this, you know, three story high rise, four story high rise. But, it, but the logic here was that we were on a hill and uh, we had this funny road in between where the main lake house that you were looking at, the boat house, and, and, and then there's a huge big steep hill here. So we went straight up along the hill uh, which is an interesting experience of a whole series of rooms, all outdoor circulation. But as you got higher up, you were then viewing over this road that separated you from where their boats would be. So it was a successful way of doing a house. But then you had to think, well, how are we going to move up and down? So the stairwell obviously became the main hall of the house. So this open stairwell that's encased by perforated metal, um, and it's kind of dug into the ground at the lowest level, and then you, you slowly march up. And then finally, when you get up to the top of the house, it bridges back to this beautiful hill. So even though you're perched four stories practically above the ground, uh, on the backside, you're connected straight to the hill. So you have hill and lake uh, you know, kind of closely connected. Uh, and, and, and you have these obviously great views and simple rooms. And one room wide, often the way we think is, you know, if you can have balanced light and, 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 and balanced cross ventilation. So thinking always about, usually about certainly houses like this, about um, how important it is to be able to open the windows and doors and turn off the air conditioning. 